Like I've got um, the Paul McCartney record right there, the reissue. And Miles Sherwell's a good guy. I've talked to him. His lathe is all tricked out. I'm sorry to tell you, if you play his reissue, it's good. If you play the original British one, it's like, he's right there. Mac is right there singing huh. for you. And when he hits the drum on the first track, it's right there. When you play the, it's not as good. It's It's got this thing over it. It's got this flatness about it. It's just not, not as good. Okay, his drum solo, he could have done without. He's not a great drummer. I think I could think, he's Mac, he can do whatever he wants. You know this one? This is the craziest record. Did I talk about this one time before? You did. I, okay, so forget it. The wank is playing, he's run out of things to say, <laughs> so he's doing the same things over again. He's just an old man in a bad room. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> when I read that, this guy, you know what I loved about it? He was so angry. Just my name showing up there made him so angry. So this is a, a Pink Moon and Nick, Nick Drake. Wink. And this is not an original. You know, the originals of these go for a huge amount. This is a later, it's a later label. But, you know, Nick Drake never sold many records. It's only later that younger generations of depressed young people who were suicidal uh, really caught on to this. So this is a, it's a really early pressing though because it, it's his first lacquer. It's the uh, first, it's the second mother. And they forgot to put a stamper number on this one, on this side. And this side is first lacquer and first mother. And the stamper number is, oh no, no stamper number. By this time they stopped doing that. Second, it's the second mother and there's no stamper number. But, it's, it's, so it's essentially just about as good as, and it sounds, it's, when I, when I feel like slitting my wrist, which I've never done, but I feel like it, I'll put this record on because it resonates with my feelings of melancholy, ennui. What's your favorite Nick Drake song for that sort of mood? Pink, well, Pink Moon. Pink Moon Pink is like, moon. I like River Man, that's the really it's depressing Riverman's, one. Yeah, it's another one. I don't even know what the, what the word ennui means, and this record represents it. I took out two two ERCs, a stereo and a mono. And what's really stupid about this is that the only way to know which is which is from the card that comes with it. But they kept the same jacket and the same label. Quiet Kenny, right? Yeah, Quiet. It's a, I love it. But unless you know, yeah, unless you had the card set, no, this this strip says what, which is stereo, which is mono. It's it's really good. I admit to being extremely lucky to get these records. I never asked for them. When I first heard about them, uh, I sent him an email and I said, Pete, I don't expect to get these for free, but if you could give me some kind of industry discount, I'll buy them. And he sends them all to me. And then by the time I get them, they're sold out. So what's the point of reviewing them? Because it, it, it just sticks it in people's faces. You know, they can't get it. Not everybody thinks they're better. Some people like the, the ones that Chad did, that, that the Kevin Gray cut from a solid state system. You know, it's like the difference between a tube amp and a solid state amp. These are a little fuller, richer. You know, the cymbals have more like but the bottom end doesn't have this. And if you, if you play the ones that Kevin cut, well done, yeah. much less expensive. They've got more snap to them. And different people prefer different ones depending upon your system and what you like to listen to. This is one of my favorite uh, blue notes, Larry Young. And did I show this one? No. This is, if you get a hold of a copy of this, it's, it's great. And I was really lucky because uh, Larry Young's grandson came down here to hear this record on my system. He'd never heard a really good stereo. Wow. And uh, he came down and I played this record for him. And wow. it was like, it was, it was great. I could tell it moved him. No, this is just, mm, just the blue note. Maybe it is, maybe it is music matters. I don't know. They don't, they don't identify these things. You have to just kind of know it. But it's, but it's a, it's a double 45. So it's really good sound. T-Rex. Classic record, and uh, this just got reissued again. There was, there was a really crappy reissue from um, from Rhino about ten years ago. Or so. It was just just crappy. I don't know what they cut it from. This is on Fly Records, Dumbarton House, Oxford Street, London. I don't know whether this is the original or it was a reissue, but this one was cut by by uh, George Peckham. Porky Prime cut. So it's a Porky Prime cut. It's the best one. It it just rocks like crazy. So on this side it says, uh, it, he'll either sign it Peco Duck, a Porky Prime Cut, or just Porky. This one just says Porky on this side, and this side says Peco Duck. This record, this, this version. And interesting, this, this record was recorded in, in LA, 
parts of it in LA, part, parts of it in, at AdVision in, in the UK. And so I don't know where the, and Tony Visconti produced it, it was recorded at Wally Hyder's Trident and AdVision. So, and the engineers were Rick Baconin, who you may know the name, uh, Malcolm Cecil, everybody knows the name, Roy, Roy Thomas Baker, who went out to do Queen, and Martin Rush, and all engineers worked on it. And this record just got, mm. this is the one to have, I've heard every other, I have the original American, eh, not so good. Elton John's, uh, and this was his second album, I think, but the one that made him famous. So this is an original Dick James music pressing. And I've got multiple Dick James music pressings, but there's something weird going on with these. This is the only one that's incredible. And this is this one has a, a stamped mastering thing on it, which is the same. You can you can sort of know who 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 did this. It's the same one that that uh, that Island used at the beginning. The early Islands were cut at the same place. The er I think some of the early Pies were cut at this place. But uh, your song, or Take Me to the Pilot, has bass on it that so intense that for the American original on uni, they just cut the bass off at 80 hertz and the record is dead in the world. And people say, the, I prefer the American original. No, you don't. It's got no bass. None. It's cut off. I'll play this record for you and this room's going to light up. So this is the original. I lost it for two months. It was stuck in here in the wrong place, but I found it. But you do have this organized in some fashion, obviously. My records are organized by race. So, no. <laughs> So this is one. This, look at the white guy dropped the strikers. So this is one of the bad ones. It looks the same, right? It looks like the same right. record. The texture of the cover is different, and uh, it's got the Dick James music label. But you can look through it, and it's purple. Can you see that from where you are? It's trans oh, yeah. translucent purple, and it Bizarre. was hand. And it was hand. Uh, whoever cut this, hand scribed it. Huh. And it just doesn't and it doesn't sound good. We're almost done. I can go back to wanking. Davy Spillane, this is a bagpipe record. And uh, one of my readers turned me on to this in the early 90s. Could have been late 80s. He said, just get a copy of this. So it's a bagpipe record, but it's got it's got Albert Lee, Christy Moore, it's got um, Bella Fleck, Jerry Douglas. It's got great players on it. And the, the, the title track, Atlantic Bridge, is a long song that explains in music how the Irish came to America and created bluegrass. It starts out being real Irish kind of music and then it, then it sort of transit and sonically it's a killer. And then this record, more people come here and play this and they go immediately on, on Amazon and find a used copy and buy it. It's spectacular. <laughs> His other records are just basically new age, Sioux age, not, not, not like, but this one's really good. Okay, so this is Chad's T for the Tillerman. Now, this T for the Tillerman to me is easily the best T for the Tillerman. Huh. You see, he's, he's reproduced the original matte jacket. This is a double 45 version. I'm gonna expose something right now. Not my wiener, don't worry. Okay, here it is. Here, here's the original Pink Label Island <clears throat> copy. And if you look on the inner groove area, you will see a Sterling record stamp and LH for Lee Hulko. So even though this is a Pink Label Island. A lot of the Pink Label Islands that people love were actually mastered in America by Lee Hulko at Sterling Sound, and then huh. they would fly the, the the lacquer overseas overnight on a plane, and then do all the plating and pressing. If you compare the A and M original of this, which has got the same stamp on it, there's no compa This is so much better. Why is that? You think the vinyl? Uh, the plating is so critical to all of this. Hmm. Bad plating. <laughs> Plating is, is the magic sauce in a lot of ways. That's why, you know, RTI's got great guys doing it, and Chad's got Gary Salstrom. These are, these are like the geniuses. They know how to do plating. It's... At any rate, people prefer this version. It's a much mellower sounding version than this. He plays an Ovation guitar. If you've heard an Ovation guitar, it's like a cheese grater. It's you strum that thing. It's bright and yeah, the, it's not, the back is made out of wood. Yeah, it's made out of plastic. plastic. It's weird. bright and it's got a certain sound. It's a great sound <laughs> if you like that sound. And that's what he wanted. That's what he played. It doesn't sound like that on this record at all. Wow. It's soft. The record is soft and sweet and beautiful, and the bass is got boom. But that's because accidentally the Dolby was left on, and it's not a Dolby tape. That's what happened. Might as well know it now. This is what the tape said. And when Chad got the tape and cut it and heard it, 
he said he sent me a copy he said hey man i don't know if the audio files are going to go for this it when he starts wailing on that ovation it's really i said but that's what it sounds like he says i cut another one i cut one that they softened it up and he pl and he sent me that too and i said that's not the record though it's you can hear that you did that this is wonderful and romantic but it's not this is what was meant great record and the you know everything about this record was great the production was great the arranging <clears throat> arrangements on it were great songs are great the packaging the packaging looks like what the record sounds i love when the packaging of a record looks like what the record sounds like masterpieces by ellington you know this record gets standing ovations when i play for people i've got an original i think i, I think i t talked about this last time it's just and everybody when they hear this they just can't yeah, believe great. what have we done in 60 years to the art of recording when you listen to this record it's, I mean, aside from the music, which is incredible. Okay, this is an original Ogden's Nut Gone Flake. This is the British, the American one sucks. The American one is use, useless. This is the original British. I've got three or four original British ones, but only this one's magic. I don't huh. know why. The other ones are okay. This one's, it's a Glenn Johns recording, four track recording. This record was voted number one in 1967 by NME and Sgt. Pepper came in second. Okay, as the greatest rock records? Of the year. Here's a kind of blue. This is the 45 RPM uh, single-sided classic record version that Bernie Grumman cut from the original three-track master. At the time, Columbia Records or Sony, whoever owned it, was, was willing to send the three-track master all the way to California to Bernie. And Bernie cut, put up three-track and cut it. And it's spectacular you know the original i've got two originals they're magical in their own ways they don't have the bass is a little bit rolled off right. as they did in those days and there's a lot of echo on it a lot i think bernie added less to it because the echo came out of the came out of the the 30th studio uh, echo yeah. chamber <laughs> and the three track tape i don't think had it on it as i recall bernie had a had to use a try to make it sound as close as he could. And the one Mark Wilder mixed down that, that is what was used by uh, music director by Mobile Fidelity is very good. It's all analog, but it's drier. And uh, it, it loses some of the magic, but it also, it's it's good in its own way. They're all good, you know? This one's particularly great though, at 45. I'm probably gonna retire on this one alone. This is out of the cool. This is like, to me, this is 1961 Gil Evans did this. And it took Miles Davis eight more years to do In a Silent Way. Because you listen to this record and you'll hear a lot of what ended up mm. in a silent way. The recording is astonishing. They give you, they show you where people are sitting. So you know, and, and the recording is so three dimensional that uh, if you play it in a good system, you'll know when someone takes a solo, you can say, oh, he's he's two steps behind this guy. Oh, the tuba guy, the percussion's behind the tuba guy. And the bass trombone is in front of the tuba guy. But it's an incredible recording. It may have been done in New York. I don't know. And the tape got burnt up in the Universal. So uh, if, if you, either an original, Chad did it as a double 45 using the best available source. The best available source was not very good. It was, it's, it's not good. If you see that one, sorry, it's just not that good. Now this one is alto, an, the alto analog version. Uh, this guy Joachim goes, Bose came to uh, America, a German guy came to America in 1997. And uh, he licensed some titles from Universal including this one and so this is cut from the original master tape and it's sonically spectacular and those are hard to find now the alto yeah, analog i got one for 40 bucks last year for my genius 14 year old writer and uh 40 bucks and he loves it and it's a great record okay here's a sealed copy of ama jamal the alhambra huh. also alto analog tapes burned up and i've got test pressing of this too is incredible sounding record. I play the test pressing. I don't. I'm not on opening this up because as time passes, uh, you know, it's more and more collectible. How's the original, which is not hard to find? Does that sound yeah. good too? I'm sure it's pretty good. But huh. this is the original <clears throat> tape. Bernie cut it from the original tape. Oh. Pressed it. You know, RTI. It's it's going to be better. So this this is Van Dyke Park song like This came out in 1969. This is uh, one of the most Lee Hirschberg and Bruce Botnick were involved in this. This is, to me, the epitome of great studio recordings. It's like the Sgt. Pepper of Americana. You know, Van Dyke Parks worked with Brian Wilson, and I didn't tell, did I tell Brian Wilson's story last time? How I fixed his turntable? That's a great story, but 
Maybe we'll save that for another. I wow. think it's Brian Wilson's turn table. That was a, that's something you remember for your whole life when you do that. And it was all accidental that I got to his house because my friend was the doctor bringing him his drugs. <laughs> it's an incredible story. So uh, this record, uh, it's Van, it's Van Dyke Parks's the story of his uh, upbringing in the South, moving to L.A., Los Angeles <clears> in the '60s. It's one of the best signing records I've ever heard, and uh, it's kind of obscure. Now, I bought it when it first came out, and my copy's got the green label, the green Warner's label. And then I went to a guy's house, I forgot that guy's name, but he uh, he was a um, an executive at Columbia Records, lived in Connecticut, and he, had, he was selling his records off. So like, I got a sealed original first Birds album from him, promo copy, it was like, 30 bucks, paid it. He didn't know what this record was, so it was 10 bucks. And I took it out of the sleeve, and it was the gold label. This to me is like... <laughs> now why are some of those gold? Well, the, that was the original Warner Brothers label. Oh. If you got like all the Peter, Paul, and Mary albums when they first came out, oh. it was gold. Gold label. This record, there's a, guy that, there's a guy who wrote for Rolling Stone named Jimmy Fink. Jimmy Fink reviewed this record, and he said, this is the worst rock and roll record ever made. Yeah, Jimmy, because it's not a rock and roll record, okay? It's like, I have a Be this Beethoven, Sixth Symphony, it's the worst rock and roll record you ever, <laughs> <It> was like, <laughs> this is an amazing record. If you can get a copy, clean copy of this, it's, I wish ERC would do a reissue of this. I wish somebody would do a reissue of it. It's not for everybody, but the more you play it, the more you understand what he's doing. Sonically, it's, it's incredible. I love all his lyrics. He did all of Surf stuff, right? Yeah. Isn't that all him? And the lyrics are like that on this record. They're funny. Uh, he t he, he, take, he brings up the war in Vietnam, race related. Everything that's relevant to today is is in this record from 1969. We've gone nowhere. Yeah. We've gone backwards. So this is a, an original a Vanguard. Chad's reissue this. These these Vanguards, uh, classical, stereo. Lobe. I think Mark Abort engineered a lot of these. And I think Mark Abort also engineered. Uh, I believe he engineered Joan Joan Baez's first record. He engineered. Uh, he could have done the Weavers' Return to Carnegie Hall too. He was great. I think he's still alive. He's a great engineer. I interviewed him. You can find it on, on Analog Planet. This interview with Mark Abort. And these were spectacular recordings. If you can find them, this is American classical music. And so Leopold Stokowski conducted the Symphony of the Air. I think they pulled it out of the air. <laughs> they pulled the Symphony Orchestra out of the air and gave it a name. I don't know. But these are fantastic recordings and simply mic'd. Everything that audiophiles love, and this may have been uh, processed by RCA. Let me see. You know, they use it for the soundtrack to meat commercials. Yeah, this this was processed by RCA. So, in other words, they cut it and they gave uh, they gave the lacquer, they gave the tape to RCA. RCA cut the lacquer because it's got all the RCA stamps on it, and it was pressed in New Jersey at Rockaway, the Rockaway uh, pressing plant. I love the forensics about all of this. You can see yeah. where things were from. I, I keep thinking I'm going to go to Rockaway, New Jersey, and find some old guy. You know. He's a, he like records. I worked for RCA back in the day. He's a whole basement full of. <laughs> this is uh, this is the video. All stars play TV jazz themes on Somerset Records. Somerset Records was the label that did 101 Strings. <laughs> Remember 101 Strings? Of course. Elevator music. So, I saw this record at a garage sale or something, and I look and I see it says Somerset Records 101 Strings. Oh my God, who wants this? It's got TV theme songs. All right. So then. I look a little bit more carefully at it. Audio mix Bill Putnam. Bill Putnam, one of the legendary engineers, he built the great studios in Los Angeles. He, it, I think Frank Sinatra brought Bill Putnam from Chicago, because he he had big studios in Chicago to build either radio record one of the one of the big studios in, I think it was radio recorders in Los Angeles, and when stereo happened, he started this label. Or he did the video All Stars and Somerset Records released it. And who plays on this? Shelley Mann, Gus Pavona, Paul Horn, Red Mitchell, Dick Nash, Frank Rossellino. They're all over this record. So I said, you know what? For a dollar, I'll take it. It's insane. Huh. The sound of this record is insane. And now it's collectible. You know, you, it, it's, it's incredible. Okay, so yeah, this is an original. Uh, this ERC did this also and did a great job with it. This is an original Elgar cello concerto with Jacqueline Dupre. And Sir John Barbaroli, and this is an original EMI. It's very costly these days. 
to get this record. It's just this is this is a the first movement is what they always play in documentaries about the bombing of Britain. It's always, and then during the war, the German V2 bombers leveled Britain, and they show the footage. They play the opening of this piece, which is like a great piece of music. You play this, and then you play some of the other depressing music that I've talked about from the Absolute Sound. Had this, he loved British classical music, and this is kind of a cor corny music, but the sound on this record is absolutely spectacular, and it goes for a lot, a lot of money. So I got this copy of this record. I was in the UK. It's the same time I got that copy of, of the British White Album. I was in Islington. And there was a rough trade there, like a small rough trade. And so you go into a rock and roll store, and the classical music section is always going to be really small. But they don't know what they have. So I walk in, there's like 10 records. This is one of the records. It was one pound for this record. Go see what this record goes for. If I, when people want to hear how the, how the speaker soundstage, I play this record. And it's like... I played this for Dowler Wilson from Wilson Audio. I brought this out. I set up his turntable, and I played this record for him. He just couldn't believe it because it it shows off what these speakers do really well sp spatially. And my original British Abbey Road. This is my original, original, original British pressing. And I bought this in 1969. I got to Boston to go to law school, and. Uh, BU Law School was down on Kenmore Square, in Kenmore Square. So the first day was lunchtime. I walked down to the corner, and there was a record store, right on the corner. It was Music City, New England Music City, and there was a point of purchase um, rack there, like a cardboard rack with a bunch of records. I couldn't see what the record was because it was on an angle like that. And British records in those days were sealed in a very loose-fitting plastic wrap because they knew better than to put shrink wrap because shrink wrap can warp records. So it was loose fitting. I said, oh, it's a British press. I got to go see what it is. And I walk up there. It was Abbey Road, which has, wasn't going to come out in America for weeks. So I bought the copy. And this is it. Played this record endlessly. And I did the Kermis method on this. And I'll show you. I've got a, another early pressing of it. Doesn't sound nearly as good. And if you look at this one, you can see for the colors are off. You can see that they clipped. Look, <laughs> see that in that? They took a picture of the... I don't know why they did that. It was early pressing. And for some reason... See, the apple is offset. You can see the difference? Somebody insists to me it's not... The apple is not offset. It's just the way they cut the thing. No, you can it's see totally the apple offset. is offset. Why do people argue over that? They argued with me. Oh, the apple's not really offset. It's when they cut the... They cut the back jacket. Which is the original? Top or the bottom? That's the original. That's really bizarre. Look at the difference in the... In the, in the the color. You can see it's a picture of a picture. It right. almost looks like how reissues today look when they can't get an original jacket. And the, got and the sound there. isn't as good. The sound's good, but th this one is, is the one. And it still sounds... I, I digitize this and bring it to shows. And people who've never heard of Good Abbey Road, because they only know the American one, I played it in that same Von Schweiger. People sit through all of Side 2. And at the end, people were, cr they were crying. And people were cr literally crying. I swear I to God. It, yeah. And they don't cry from... CDs. I'm sorry. So, th so those are the records I brought for you to listen to, oh. and I enjoy doing this because uh, I'm very lonely. <laughs> I sit down here all alone. I see my neighbors, and you know they don't care about any of this stuff. They really none of the. Well, actually, my neighbor's son now is into it. I got him a turntable, and he's. I have two two neighbors on the other side of the street, young kids that are into this now. I'm, I'm like the Pied Piper. Pied Piper. Oh. You can cut that. <laughs> okay. Did I say that? I think I said it's okay now.